Hey everybody, uh, we're gonna just hold for a moment while we make sure that we're streaming to all of you watching on Facebook Live and just get everybody in the Zoom room here. So just bear with us for just one moment and we'll go ahead and get started. All right, looks like we're live streaming now on Facebook and Zoom. Hey everybody, this is Jeff Martin with Magic City Books. Thank you for coming to join us tonight. It's part of our weekly virtual author series, which we do two or three author events a week, mostly on Mondays and Thursdays. Um, but gosh, I was just looking at our schedule for April and May, and it's gonna be packed. We have a few weeks in there where we have five and one week, even six events per week. So a lot of stuff coming up. So I would encourage you to go to our website, magiccitybooks.com. You can see all the stuff coming up. I won't go through the full list because one, it's a long list and two, you're not here for that. So check that out. Um, really excited about tonight's event. I got a chance to meet our guest author several years ago when he came to Tulsa for his last book, um, uh, The Mad Feast. Now, The Mad Feast is a book about the culinary items, the foodstuffs that make up the broader country, the United States. You know, like what is the Vermont dish that describes Vermont? What's, what's Alabama? Oklahoma, as it happens, is barbecued bologna which if you haven't had it, I think sounds pretty gross, but if you have had it, you know just how good it really truly is. Um, so we brought Matt in to, to talk about that book and got a chance to hang out a bit. Um, but when I kind of heard about this new book and what it's about, I kind of became a little bit jealous because I thought, you know, this guy kind of has that rare opportunity to I get to write about all kinds of different topics. I think some people really get put into a corner and they have to write about the same thing. And I think someone like our guest tonight has this endless curiosity and gets to kind of pursue wherever that curiosity leads. And that's how you end up writing a book like Flight of the Diamond Smugglers, which is a story about pigeons smuggling diamonds all set in South Africa. It is um, one of those great nonfiction, um, literary creative nonfiction books that you just want to kind of sit down and plow through. You don't know anything about it. I had no real base of knowledge on this topic, which I sometimes love just entering this new world, uh, going to a place, a literal place like South Africa, which I've not been to, but uh, Matt paints such a vivid picture of that. And also who doesn't want to learn more? about diamond smuggling pigeons. So to get to that topic, and tonight we're gonna to be selling that book, of course, we want you guys to buy a copy. You can look in the chat function here and get a copy. We're gonna keep putting links in there so you can do that. We'd love it if you get a copy from us and support Matt and also Magic City Books. Um, and also you're gonna have some questions probably because we're gonna be talking about all kinds of different things. And if you have those, put those in the Q and A, maybe that's here. We'll say it's right here on your screen. Um, put those in the Q&A and we will try to get to some of those as we go. So without any further ado, I'm going to welcome our very special guest author, Matthew Gavin Frank. Hey, Matt. Hi, Jeff. Oh, wait a second. Hold on. Time out. I was expecting an author. It looks like we've had an interloper. Uh, oh, okay. There's the Scooby-Doo reveal. <laughs> Thank goodness. Bye. Hello you would, you would have got away with it too if it wasn't for all those darn kids. <laughs> they're, uh, they're foiling this pigeon all the time. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us and also for playing along with that bit of silliness. We need that occasionally. <laughs> um, and also, where the hell did you get that mask, by the way? I have to ask. Oh, um, Etsy? I think it was Etsy. <laughs> yeah, I think I found it on Etsy. So somebody um, out there is making money making pigeon masks on Etsy. They have all sorts of pigeon masks. This was the cheapest one. Um, I, I can neither see nor breathe in it though. So it's not like yeah. terribly functional. But. Yeah, not good for like a bank robbery or something. Um, right. So thrilled to have you back here virtually. I'm sorry we couldn't do this in person, but um, I, I uh, have fond memories of when we got to hang out here in Tulsa and we had a great time. Um, I'm curious to know how a story like this um, gets started and also how do you know because you've written a lot of you know a lot of journalism as well how do you kind of know when something is an article or when something is a book you know how do you does it just reveal itself at some point 
Yeah, um, I, I never know when I start. Uh, I always feel uh, like as if like the muse arrives uh, during the process and not beforehand. Um, so I, I thought, um, I mean, a couple of books ago um, that I, I, I wrote about the giant squid and the first ever photograph taken of the giant squid, I thought that was gonna be a five page essay, um, but I tumbled down the rabbit hole and, and it became a book. Uh, I had no idea what I was doing with, with Flight of the Diamond Smugglers. I, um, I, I mean, I found the story this way, like I'm, I'm just essentially obsessive. Uh, and I had heard that, um, so my wife is from South Africa. She grew up there. Her entire family is still in Johannesburg. So we've been back a number of times. Um, but like on our 10th time there, I had heard that there was an area in the Northwest corner of the country close to the Namibian border that was colloquially known as the Diamond Coast. And it had been closed off to the public um, uh, basically in between like 1925 to 2007. It was an erasure from the map. Um, the landscape was dominated by these De Beers controlled diamond mines and these attendant diamond towns and De Beers owned that entire region. Um, and just kind of even, this even called the forbidden zone, right? This was referred to as the forbidden zone. That's right. Yeah. You, I mean, unless you labored for De Beers, um, there was no going in, there was no going out. And so like when they deemed the area overmined in 2007 and slowly started um, laying off some of the workforce and mining just a little bit less in the area, um, some of these doors to these previously closed off towns that had been closed across generations, um, began opening it, um, themselves up to the public. And I, I guess most writers can claim this, but I'm a trespasser. Um, like I like going into forbidden zones. Um, and I was, I, I just thought that was, it sounded electric. I wanted to go there. And then eventually I found a few things. <laughs> you know, when, when you were a kid, I'm curious, you know, that instinct to trespass is obviously born out of a general curiosity, which is also why you write. Um, you know, were you getting in trouble a lot as a kid for like trespassing and going places you shouldn't have? Was that, was that, <laughs> was that the kind of thing you would do? Yeah, I, I, I think like maybe like 10 out of my 12 juvenile arrests were for trespassing. Um, I would uh, I would love climbing on roofs, um, like getting over barbed wire. Uh, I grew up um, around Chicago and I remember like I climbed like a, a really, really tall fence and got over some razor wire um, at the uh, Arlington race course, um, like that horse track. Um, because for some reason, I just wanted to take a loop around the, the track there. Um, so it was basically that and shoplifting. I mean, nothing, nothing too terribly. Uh, just the basics. Yeah. Just yeah. The basics. <laughs> um, I'm curious, you, you spent a long time, I don't know, 20 years of your life in the restaurant industry and cooking and working. I mean, from like a teenager, you know, into what, 30 years old. I don't know how old you were when you kind of got out of that, but a long time. And um, you kind of transitioned from like fast food into more of a fine dining space. Um, I'm getting at the point of this. What I find fascinating is this book started out quite long and you kind of took it down to this really, what I think is a really tight narrative. You know, it's like 200 something pages and it reads super fast. That's got that really good pacing and, and it's got a momentum to it, which it, I'm sure it would not have had at the, 700 page at 700 page length or whatever it was <laughs> but I think do you think that the instinct to edit and to kind of take things down to their most basic ingredients is kind of a thing that's kind of connected between that world and this world that kind of food world in here because when you hear a chef for example talk about what they like to eat it's always like something super simple it's like Cacio a Pepe. It's not some crazy fancy like tasting meal at at El Bui or whatever. You know, it's it's something like that. So, you know, is it instinctual for you to try to find the minimal, or are you a maximalist first and then have to pare it down? I'm I'm a maximalist first. Um, like I'll throw in every spice from the spice rack first, um, and then try and fix it. Uh, you know, and what do I have to do in order to fix it? In order to make it simple again, I, I I suppose. But like, I mean, I could come up with a bunch of food metaphors as far as like you know, of course, cutting goes, like trimming the fat cap off of the brisket, or making a reduction sauce, or getting it down to like a bouillon cube, you know, something like really really concentrated, but it still has all of those ingredients in there. It's just smaller. 
Um, but like, I, I think uh, the ways in which like I, I carry like process from the restaurant kitchen over to writing sometimes um, has to do with taking like two seemingly different bits of subject matter and then trying to find that third ingredient, that bridge ingredient that will kind of marry those seemingly dissimilar ingredients into something that bears the illusion of harmony. Um, so like in the, in the fine dining restaurant kitchen, like we would challenge each other all the time to, you know, say, okay, peeled green grape and lamb what's the perfect bridge ingredient to like marry those two and things. Um, and of course the answer is, is rosemary, but um, so I, I think about that all the time. I mean, I mean, pigeons, diamond smuggling, um, grief pigeon, like, I mean, how am I going to get those things to, to um, kind of work together? What other kind of research do I have to do? What, what other kind of third bit of subject matter perhaps do I have to uncover? Um, so those two things kind of um, connect as if, you know, one tin can telephone strung to another. Um, I'm curious um, to start, I wanna start our viewers with a couple of real basic things. One is, what is, because we've heard, I think, about carrier pigeons. They're oftentimes called passenger pigeons. They're called homing pigeons. Are those all the same things? Are we, are we using different words? And also, what is a homing pigeon? I think we, we, we read about it, but they've been so kind of out of, you know, normal use that we don't really have any practical application for what that is. Yeah, oftentimes like carrier pigeons and homing pigeons um, are, are, are the same um, because if they carry, they need to be able to find their way to a specific spot. So like the Reuters press agency, you know, was actually built on pigeon backs. Um, I mean, these pigeons would um, literally deliver information um, from one uh, like telegraph line terminus to another and things. Um, not only information, but um, uh, I mean, confidential blueprints for, um, for uh, uh, like robots meant to land on Mars, um, heart tissue uh, and, and things, um, blood samples. Um, they would deliver essentially like uh, messages that signified the beginnings and ends of wars. Uh, uh, prisoners would oftentimes train pigeons to, uh, in order to smuggle heroin um, in, into and out of a prison uh, and things. I mean, not so much anymore, but, but back in the day. Passenger pigeons are different. Um, passenger pigeons uh, are actually an extinct species of pigeon. Um, they were actually once the most abundant bird uh, on the planet. Um, in fact, they were like the most abundant animal next to some certain species of locust. Um, but uh, we effectively eradicated them by um, deforestation, uh, eradicating, yeah, their nesting grounds. And we saw them as pests because they ate our crops. So, uh, you know, this was like um, the 1870s circa, we would um, actually start communicating with one another as communication and um, transportation developed. Um, we would communicate with each other and tell um, one another where their nesting grounds were. And we would organize these angry mobs and we just like eradicated the passenger pigeon. Um, so the passenger pigeon hasn't been with us since I believe it was 1914, um, Martha, the world's last passenger pigeon, um, died alone in a cage in the Cincinnati Zoo. So, um, which is no place to die alone. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I, um, when you talk about what they carry, you mentioned, of course, it's all notes, right? We, aren't, we mostly don't think of them as carrying physical objects beyond like, you know, you see a little scroll or something, they roll up into a thing and put in their feet. But, you know, before we get too far, what kind of weight are we talking that an average homing pigeon could carry without uh, dropping out of the sky or just too much drag on it? Well, yeah, I mean, not much uh, because, I mean, the, the average, uh, you know, carrier pigeon weighs anywhere from like eight to 14 ounces. Um, so it, it, it can't, I mean, it can't carry much more than, say, a tenth of its body weight without its natural GPS. I mean, it can carry it, but its natural GPS, actually, if a pigeon is overloaded with cargo, it starts to lose that natural GPS and it won't find its way home and it will begin to land at random. 
And when you are carrying illicitly smuggled diamonds um, in an area where, um, you know, an ancillary industry of diamond smuggling is uh, actually um, fairly widespread and a lot of folks are involved. Um, that could be very dangerous for the pigeon and it could retroactively be very dangerous for the person who had trained that pigeon. What, we'll, we'll wrap up our pigeon section here in a moment, but I want to keep di deep diving into pigeon, which is, um, what is it about a pigeon that's different than say, I don't know, a robin or a cardinal or any other thing? Why, why can they do this and other birds can't? Does science know that answer? Um, I, I mean, the, the details are still confounding to us. Um, I mean, the simple answer is, is they're much, much smarter. Uh, I mean, they're incredibly smart birds. Um, they're not only hailed as um, arguably uh, the most intelligent of uh, bird species, um, but the, one of the most intelligent animals on the planet. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we tend to think of them, we tend to dismiss pigeons these days because of their ubiquity. They're so common. And we've, we've gotten to the point where we associate the mundane with the boring, uh, the mundane with the uninteresting. Can something be both mundane and exhilarating and electric and beautiful? Um, and, and the pigeon is. Uh, so for instance, compared to those, compared to robins and cardinals, um, the pigeon has um, proven uh, to have had the ability to recognize all 26 letters of the English alphabet and other alphabets if they're trained uh, to do so. The pigeon um, passes what's known as the mirror test, which very few um, animals besides the human animal does. And that basically means it recognizes its own reflection as itself um, and not as another animal. It recognizes, it, it can conceptualize of the reflection of its own reflection, um, which is pretty complex. Uh, the pigeon exhibits some um, superstitious behavior um, that we, uh, that, or at least that we perceive it to be superstitious behavior. Uh, and things too. So um, they're they're brilliant animals. As far as figuring out how they home, we have a bunch of theories, but all of them are incompletely proven. And um, the the actual answer still resides. Uh, it's cloaked in a bit of mystery. You know, I think after having read this, I'll never look at pigeons in the park the same way again. I think you know that's maybe the big takeaway: respect the pigeon. I think we need to. <laughs> It's long overdue, I think. Um, so kind of paint a picture for us what, or maybe how prevalent diamond smuggling is and was in, in, in this part of Africa, South, South Africa that you're talking about. You know, was this uh, just kind of like the known practice that's like it happens and if you run a company like De Beers or one of these you know huge huge organizations is it just like built into the industry that we're going to have this much loss due to smuggling you know is it just an accepted part of doing that business? Yeah, yeah it, it, it is um, and uh, the and, and it's known that um, I was told by a former head of um, one of the diamond mines there that historically in the town of Port Nalith, South Africa, which is a diamond town, um, every single mayor in Port Nalith's history was arrested for diamond smuggling. Um, I was constantly told that, I mean, it seems so illicit, but most everybody there is involved in some way or another. Um, there's just a hierarchy um, there and there's, there's kind of like a caste system uh, built in. So you have your laborers who um, are literally sweeping the ground um, and digging into the ground for diamonds, your diamond miners. And then you have the security guards um, who lord over them and exact these oftentimes brutal punishments onto the laborers if the laborers are caught smuggling diamonds. But then the security guards kind of have their own thing going on the side also, um, as do the mine managers who lord over the security guards. Um, but then if the security guards are caught by the mine managers, then they're kind of like evicted into the gullet of the desert and kicked out of the town um, and things. So there's um, different levels of punishment that are levied by each kind of, uh, um, cast as it were um, onto, onto the folks um, 
uh, beneath them. The, um, the folks that are suffering the greatest sense of loss, though, certainly aren't De Beers. They're doing just fine. Um, I mean, De Beers is, is really exploiting um, a workforce there uh, and not only destroying their land, so it can't really be farmed on um, after it's been um, mined for diamonds, um, but um, their um, folks are just paid horribly there compared to what De Beers' bottom line is. Um, I mean, for instance, just to throw like a couple of numbers out there, like um, according to like Bain, um, the global, the, this global diamond report, the annual diamond harvest a few years ago was about 176 million carats. Uh, a diamond um, costs us anywhere, depending, um, $3,000 to $23,000 per carat. Um, the diamond uh, diggers there, uh, I, I, I was told, um, they get about 20 cents commission per carat on Earth. 20 cents. Um, so De Beers is, is pocketing a lot, and a lot of folks um, who are diamond mining see diamond smuggling as a necessity in order to feed their families um, because they're not making enough working legit for the legitimate car diamond cartel um, as De Beers is known there. And they're known as like the syndicate or the cartel. Um, and so smuggling in part becomes an act of necessary resistance. Um, I would assume most people watching uh, know what apartheid was and, and how, you know how, how that came to an end. But I'm curious if you could talk about how little the change when apartheid stopped, how little that actually impacted the practices of these uh, diamond mines. Because it, of course, changed the politics of South Africa, it changed a lot of different things, but some of these industries seem to have just kind of kept on doing what they were doing. Um, you know, so in, in the early 1990s, in the 80s, when those things were starting to kind of fray and come apart, you know, um, how was that impacting this industry? Yeah, so like apartheid officially ended in 1994, um, but um, apartheid policies uh, still certainly persist, um, especially um, as they pertain to corporate colonialism, um, especially if these corporations are owned by uh, a bunch of white dudes in London, um, uh, you know, England being one of the, the, the great colonizers of, of, of the world. Um, in fact, their successful col colonizing much of the world depended on pigeon excrement, um, which the British like used to, um, to extract saltpeter, an essential component in gunpowder. Um, and then they kind of like went forth with their guns and colonized the world. So way back when, when the British were busy colonizing South Africa um, originally, um, all pigeon excrement within um, you know, British borders um, was by legal decree property of the crown. Um, but in, in, in any case, yeah, um, a lot of the higher ups and the mine managers working at the mines uh, are uh, white men. Um, and a lot of the folks, um, the majority of the folks, uh, I would say 95% of the folks who are digging into the earth um, are black men um, being lorded over still um, by white men who are given uh, leeway um, both officially and unofficially to do bodily harm uh, to those black men who um, are laboring to unearth diamonds for white trillionaires. Um, this might be a dumb question, but you know I don't really know anything about precious stones and gems and things like that. But you know, when, when in human history did we decide that some rocks were more valuable than other rocks? You know, when did we decide that diamonds were going to be diamonds? You know, I mean, there's lots of things that are hard to find that have no value, but these things at some point, let's be honest, someone made a decision that this was the most valuable thing and we do that with gold, of course, probably, you know, all these different things, but, you know, when did diamonds become diamonds, right? When did they become what we think of as this most precious thing? It, it was actually the De Beers Corporation that fabricated that narrative. So, um, you know, I mean, if, if we're looking at dates like when, so um, this guy, Cecil John Rhodes, 
uh, who was um, this rich white British guy from London who had the backing of um, uh, British banks, came to South Africa in 1870 initially to um, farm cotton, um, of course not himself, uh, to farm cotton with an enslaved labor force. Um, and when his cotton venture failed, he traveled to like the diamond fields of Kimberley, South Africa, um, where folks uh, had um, basically established a ragtag jumble of tent communities that was known as New Rush. And um, people were into diamonds then, you know, they were still being, there were still diamond claims there, but diamonds weren't diamonds yet. Um, they were just another pretty shiny rock um, that could fetch a little bit of money, but not so much. Um, Cecil John Rhodes was the only guy there because he had the backing of these banks in England who could have formed steam pumps um, to kind of uh, steam away the water of flooded claims that were previously presumed ruined. And so he bought up all of these presumed, uh, these claims that were presumed ruined for a song. He paid nothing for them. Um, and then he used the steam pumps and extracted all of the diamonds and became very wealthy. And um, eventually with the backing of those banks there, he started what became the De Beers Corporation. So this began uh, in the 1870s and really accelerated on the diamond coast in South Africa when this gigantic diamond was discovered by a guy named Jack Carstens in 1925. And in 1925, that's when De Beers infiltrated um, a lot of the local governments uh, of all of these, these like at the municipal level all the way on up. And they actually decided to um, put a stranglehold on the, on the diamond market. Um, they wanted to monopolize it. So they were like, I mean, because diamonds are not rare. They still are not rare. Um, but De Beers is like, okay, we're gonna just control this. Um, we're going to declare it illegal for anybody but us, um, unless they're working for us, um, to pick up a diamond. Like if they touch the diamond and even hold it for one second, that's unauthorized contact, that's illegal, and you could be fined and carted off to jail. And back in the day, you could be maimed um, for doing that. So um, they basically have all of these diamonds, they stockpile them, but they release them onto the global market ever so slowly um, and have fictionalized this narrative of rarity and therefore preciousness, um, which just accelerated the price. They, they made it up. Um, it was, I mean, it's just completely fabricated. Um, yeah, so it, it's the beers who did it. Yeah, you know, it's interesting you said 1925. I mean, you know, basically a little bit less than a century, we've been kind of living in this world of, of kind of diamonds being what they, what they are, you know. Um, so I'm curious when you mentioned uh, Kimberley, South Africa, when, when, these, when these giant mines kind of run out of space, they leave these huge craters basically in the earth. And some of these almost become like, tourist attractions for people to go hang out in. I believe there's one around, around there in Kimberley, South Africa. Um, you know, what does, the, what does the process do to the landscape? How do people deal with these giant craters around the, around the community and how do they utilize them after the fact? Yeah, I mean, there's really not much you can do with it, um, but try and, you know, create something kitschy um, uh, of like the roadside attraction variety uh, out of it. And that's what they did in Kimberley. Um, it's known as the big hole, uh, the big hole, um, which is, yeah, it's accurate, um, uh, mine and museum. And they actually uh, erected, it looks like an old movie set, um, just kind of, it looks like an old West movie set. Um, of all of these buildings with all of this old signage and burnished wood and shellac. Um, and they tried to kind of resurrect old Kimberly. Uh, and, you know, they sell snow cones there and, uh, you know, just like kitschy little keychains that say the big hole on it and fridge magnets. Um, and all of this, and it just reads uh, like a rebuke to the actual lives that were lived there um, mm -hmm. during the active diamond mining scene, um, which, which was horrible. Uh, 
I mean, I, I mean, conditions were just um, just awful. Um, folks were like, I mean, would if, if they didn't die in mine collapses there, um, they died of disease or dysentery and things. Um, and it was just it was just an ugly, ugly place. But now, of course, I mean, we're looking at it through these these rose colored glasses. Um, it, um, diamond mining completely destroys the soil as well. It poisons the soil so nothing really uh, worthwhile to us anymore um, can grow there. So- Well, it's a good, in the, a good point actually. It's a good point in the sense of when people think about diamond mining, I think they think somebody's in there with just a little pickaxe, you know, chipping away at a wall, but there's a lot of other industry involved in this. This is not, you know, gold miners in the Yukon in, in 1850s, you know, it, it, it takes a lot of, uh, you know, um, yeah, industry to kind of do the mass level of excavation that they're doing. It's not, it's not an organic process necessarily, right? Right, yeah. Like for instance, like um, the, uh, the De Beers Namakwa land uh, mine in Kleinsia, South Africa, which is a small one um, in a small town is like 32,000 hectares of just kind of ravaged, negated earth. Uh, where nothing will grow. Um, the really disingenuous thing, Jeff, is that the Beers now has an environmental division. Um, and they, it, it's such a, I mean, they have, their, their PR machine is second to none. And so their entire um, environmental division just, I mean, floods um, all of us. Uh, with this rhetoric that the beers is so environmentally responsible. All of their diamonds are now environmentally harvested. Um, they have all of these crews that are working to rehabilitate uh, the land that they mined. Um, but I talked to a guy responsible for that rehabilitation and he admitted to me, nothing grows. They spend um, you know, millions of dollars. De Beers does throw money at it, um, but it's all for show. Um, I mean, this is pocket change for them to show that they're doing something so they could brag about it to their stakeholders um, so their stakeholders can feel better um, about the syndicate in which they hold stake, uh, but nothing grows. Um, and until we, you know, come up with with uh, some sort of revolutionary method of, of of growing and farming again, nothing will grow there. Yeah, I remember those, you know, BP commercials about sustainability and green living after the Deepwater Horizon. You know, the, the, the PR PR knows what it's doing, I guess. Um, so w when we talk about smuggling, and of course, you know, the kind of Thing you hang the hat, uh, the hang, hang the book on a little bit is this idea of using pigeons for smuggling. Is that something that was? How long was that practice being done? And then when did it become known to the higher ups that this is something that we need to actually keep an eye on? Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, the the pigeon method really only exploded in like the '90s, um, like the mid to late '90s, uh, and. Um, it's because of the, uh, I, I was, I, again, I was like talking to this head, this head of mine security and he was telling me, look, smugglers will find a way, um, you know, they would smuggle diamonds out in their clothes or in their bodies. Um, they would sw swallow them or whatever. Um, and so then they kind of put in these x-ray machines, um, in order to, yeah. So, um, but then South Africa made it a human rights, uh, a human rights violation to over-radiate a person. Um, and so they couldn't x-ray everybody every day, actually, um, upon entering and leaving the mine, because that was breaking the law. Um, so they kind of instituted a placebo system where the x-ray machine would light up and were in the same way, whether folks were receiving an actual x-ray or a placebo. So nobody knew whether they were actually being mapped or not, but they thought that that would discourage sm uh, smuggling, but it didn't. Um, and so then they started putting in these extra um, extra fencing so folks couldn't, you know, just quite simply throw a diamond over them. And eventually they put in enough fencing that no human being could hurl a diamond that far. So people got creative and started bringing in pigeons and raising pigeons. Something had to get it over all of those fences and it was a bird. Um, 
uh, it came to the attention of the higher ups. Um, I mentioned earlier, when you overload a pigeon, it loses its natural GPS and starts landing at random. And so in 1998, there was just kind of this flurry of pigeons um, that were that had diamonds tied to their feet that started landing at random along the beaches of Port Nalith, South Africa. And so, of course, um, you know, people knew about it, you know, the higher ups knew about it and having infiltrated the local governments in 1998, they actually declared it illegal to not shoot a pigeon on sight if you had the means to do so. So, for instance, if you were like walking down the streets of Port Nala, South Africa, and you had a gun strapped to your hip and a pigeon crossed in front of you and you did not kill it, and a, a, a De Beers operative who were all over the place there spotted that, you could be fined. You could be arrested. Or, or worse. Um, yeah. You know, the, the, um, the, the leeway that companies like that are given to skirt laws in terms of the way they punish people is, is quite uh, liberal, uh, you know, um, because basically they are the government in a certain sense in, in the way that, you know, it seems very much like part and parcel. Um, was there a period, you mentioned the 90s, before, the, before everyone got wise to it, I was thinking about, you know, I, it's like uh, the Seattle music scene before Nevermind came out, like, was there a golden, <laughs> was there a golden age before it got too, it got too well known where it was like, man, this was, this was working really well for, for, you know, a couple of years or whatever. There, there was never a golden age for, um, for, I mean, folks who were laboring in the diamond pits. Uh, there, was, um, there was never a golden age for diamond divers. No, I mean, I'm talking about pigeon smuggling specifically, like using that tool. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, before it became yeah known to mine security, yeah, this was... Like if I mean, you're the first guy doing it, you're like, whoa, this is amazing, you know? Right, so many, I mean, so, but so many people caught on and, and it's still going on today. Um, but um, I mean, to a lesser degree, of course, but yes, yeah, so many people started raising pigeons and it, it got to the point where, you know, legislators had to step in um, in order to um, eradicate that. But there, there was a bit of a golden age um, but the folks that really saw the spoils of that were um, were just kind of like the higher ups in politics, like the mayors who were involved at a distance in smuggling rings, who would deal with some of the folks who were actually using the pigeons um, and, and, and things. So there was a golden age for that method. Uh, but the folks who were like driving the pink Cadillacs and things, um, those were like the mayors who were dealing with the folks who were laboring in the pits. What are two or three other really creative ways you heard about people smuggling, you know, besides like sticking it up your ass or eating right. it or whatever, you know, like those are fairly obvious, but not the prison methods, but, you know, what were some ways that you were like, wow, I wouldn't have thought of that, you know? Well, the sticking it up your ass method um, just really doesn't work so well anymore either because the beer started administering and swallowing it, of course, too. Yeah. But the beer started administering um, randomly delivered uh, enemas and liquid, yeah, and liquid suppositories um, to workers after their shift. Um, they did have that leeway to do that, um, and then the workers had to like squat over a bucket, and it was some uh, dude's job who was working for security to root through the bucket um, on the lookout for swallowed diamonds. But but uh, but anyway. Um, some, uh, some other creative methods um, that I heard about were, uh, um, there was a guy who had a glass eye um, who would take it out and put diamonds into the socket um, and then put the glass eye back and smuggle diamonds out in that way. That's, uh, a, good That's a good one. There were, there were folks who on mine property, um, I mean, there are a lot of sharp tools on a diamond mine. Uh, they would slice open their forearms um, and stuff diamonds into the wound. And due to AIDS scares, uh, security didn't want to mess with it. So they rushed the workers out to um, a town hospital, which was also known by De Beers, but oftentimes, um, the folks uh, who were working at the hospitals were in on the scam. And so they would either remove the diamonds from the wound or sew the diamonds up into the wound, meet up with the worker later, um, have some sort of clandestine back alley meeting, and then remove the diamonds there. 
Um, that was another way. Uh, yeah, I mean, people well, would I mean, just. Yeah, and it's, been, it's been often said that, you know, if we could put the creativity of, of criminal enterprises into something good, we'd have like back to the future flying cars by now, probably. <laughs> but, um, so I want to say a quick commercial here. If you haven't gotten a chance to buy this wonderful book yet, I would take the opportunity to do so. Um, we've covered a lot here, but we're really just scratching the surface for what Matt does in the book here. So go into the chat there and get yourself a copy or if you know someone who loves a great nonfiction kind of journey, this is going to be for them. So, um, and also if you have questions on some of the strange things we've already been talking about, throw those into the Q&A and I'll be sure to pass those on. Um, I, I'd like to talk about, um, you mentioned that you're an obsessive by nature, but, and, and, and you know, this book required a lot of time, a lot of effort, you know, you, had, you went to South Africa, all these different things. Um, and we also talked about the fact that, you know, sometimes you don't know if it's a article or a book. Once you do decide that it's going to be a bigger project, is there ever a moment or multiple moments when you go, actually, this wasn't, <laughs> this, this wasn't a good choice to go down this road, you know, or was there a moment when you kind of thought, yeah, the story is here, you know, did you need to find that one thing to kind of center it? Yeah, for sure. Like I, I have a dozen abandoned manuscripts on my on my laptop and things, things that I thought were books, but just hit dead ends and really just had to be distilled down into maybe like two or three articles or something. Um, but uh, yeah, like I mean, sometimes like I have to write my way into something. Um, and I mean, the trick is for me, if if I'm curious about something. I'll, I'll keep pushing, I'll keep pushing, I'll keep pushing in, until I, I suppose I'll, I find that one thing. Um, uh, other, other times that thing just kind of occurs um, and it's, it's, it's completely serendipitous and um, I just can't stop. Uh, like I latch in um, and I just can't, I guess, retract my claws, like I'm into the thing. And I, I, I remember like years ago, I lived in Alaska and I remember I would watch these these eagles descend and they would sink their talons into these king salmon um, because they they wanted to eat it so badly. Um, but sometimes the king salmon was too large for them and they couldn't lift off and they and they just couldn't um, retract their talons. And so the salmon would would drown them uh, too. And I, I think about that sometimes when I'm writing, like I'm I'm in a thing. And sometimes it feels so much larger than me and it's like pulling me along. And I just, I, I hope I am, I emerge, um, you know, without water in my lungs, so to speak. <laughs> um, was it difficult to find, you know, think, looking at the kind of iron fist in a way that these companies, you know, rule over their people that work for them and the, communities that they serve because you know they're the economic engine of, of the whole area was it difficult to find people that would talk to you i i thought it would be jeff but it was so easy <laughs> um and i think it was because um these communities had been kept in isolation by the company for generations so the folks i were i, I, I was talking to folks whose parents um, were kept in isolation and whose grandparents and whose great grandparents um, were all from that area and just kind of kept in this cloister um, that De Beers um, fashioned socially, culturally, regionally. Um, and so when these doors were thrown open and um, curious folks, I guess like me, like entered the confines of these previously closed off towns, man, we stood out. Um, like I, I stood out. I wasn't from there and folks were so curious um, about me and so eager to talk to me. Just folks would approach me at random asking me who I was and what I was doing there and why I was even interested in this area. And they were so eager once I started asking more pointed questions after I told them I was interested in writing. At first I said an article and eventually a book um, about this. They were just like, oh, oh my God, I have a story for you. Oh, oh, you have to know this. Oh, you have to know this. This happened to me. And so they started kind of confessing to the things that they had bore witness to in 
isolation um, for so long and people were eager to speak to me. It was um, very unexpected. Um, I got, I'm curious, a couple more questions before we start wrapping up. Um, I, as the world far too slowly, but becomes more globalized and becomes more progressive in certain areas and you know that that kind of thing eventually starts creeping more around the globe in terms of human rights and all these things how much longer can an industry like this exist in the way that it does is this something that like 25 years from now could possibly be much different because of the way um, people are treated and the way that we you know eventually won't let that stand I, I'm hopeful because there's a lot of resistance to it in the area um, I mean, I mean, folks are busy fighting De Beers and protesting um, against some of their practices that are still implemented, uh, frankly, there. And, and oftentimes they're still coming out on the losing end. But I wonder for how much longer as, as the generations persist, um, because I mean, South Africa is becoming um, a more progressive place the further we get from, you know, the apartheid regime and things. And so um, I'm hoping, I'm, hope, I'm hopeful, but reluctantly so, because there's still a lot of corporate atrocity being perpetuated there. Um, but I do see these patterns happening. Um, De Beers is forced, however disingenuously, um, to, to have an environmental division, I guess. Um, they weren't up until a few years ago. So I guess that means a little something. Um, who knows what they're gonna be forced to do, you know, 25 years from now and um, how many divisions can they open before they start tipping toward obsolescence, right? Um, I don't know. Um, final question is this. Um, you're very much a participatory journalist. I, I, I see you kind of in the school of like the new journalism. You like to kind of be in it and not just be writing from, a you know, you like to be part of what you're doing, which I, I love that style of writing. Um, given that, did you ever consider getting your own pigeons at home and learning how to, yeah. learning how to, how to actually do that? Oh, shit, man. I, um, I have such terrible allergies. Um, so like, I mean, I, I'm a cat owner, but I have a terrible cat allergy and I've just, um, I'm so in love with pigeons. Um, but I also, um, um, would be weird about caging one and keeping it in a coop, I suppose. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I've never, I, I love birds. Jeff, like, I feel like I have two major hobbies that I haven't had the time yet to engage, but I feel like are, are lying in my future. And one is like painting watercolors and the other is serious bird watching. Like I love observing birds. I love watching them, um, but I don't have a desire to possess them. <laughs> I, I interviewed David Sibley of the Sibley Bird Guide not too long ago. And you know, he does both. So maybe you can combine those two. You know, you go watch the birds, then you go paint the birds. So that's that's your retirement, you know, future. Um, <laughs> gosh, I, I really can't tell you how much I enjoyed this book. It was just a blast to read. It also made me think about a lot of things and look at, you know, parts of the world that I think we don't, if we're kind of living these privileged lives in America, we don't think about as much. And so thanks for like giving us that exposure. Um, if you guys haven't got this book, go ahead and do it. You're going to enjoy it. You're going to want to know more. I think one of my favorite things about a great work of nonfiction is I close the book and I want to go like immediately to Wikipedia or I want to go to Google. I want to kind of keep the journey going, you know, because there's never quite enough. And this book is the kind of book that does that. So congrats, Matt, on the book. And I really appreciate you taking some time with us today. Rock on, Jeff. Thank you so much for having me. It was really good talking to you. That's yeah, good to see you. Everybody stay, take care, stay safe, and go learn how to you know, use some homing pigeons. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye.